How does one handle the day when they cross over into the world of celebrity? One day you're an average Joe. The next you've got fans and media camped out in front of your home, just hoping to catch a glimpse of you. It's not something that anyone can really prepare themselves for. You think you know how you'd react in those situations, until that day comes when you can't run quickly to the shop to grab a carton of milk, without having to stop and take ten selfies and sign a dozen autographs, before you even make it to your car. I imagine when people start to separate celebrities as being something other, as something to be treated as different from you and your class of people, then the same idea holds true in reverse. They no longer identify and relate to the average person. We put them on this pedestal, and there they reside, looking down upon us all. Within this act of separation lies a betrayal to the ones who loved and nurtured you in the days prior to your ascension upon the throne. This is Paul Ashby, better known around Manchester, England as Biggin, Biggin has spent the better part of the past 30 years being tormented by such a betrayal. Biggin was born at Withington Hospital in South Manchester and grew up in the West Point section of Levensholm, which is connected to another suburb named Burnage. It was this area of Manchester that gave us the band Oasis. While growing up in Levensholm, Biggin became friends with a gentleman named Paul Arthurs, better known as Bonehead and at around the age of 14 they began getting interested in the amazing things that were happening musically in and around Manchester. Bonehead wasn't necessarily the coolest cat in the park, but he had a talent for music and was either always talking about it or playing it himself. So much so that Biggin would often suggest that they should start a band together. Biggin would sometimes pick up the bass and attempt to jam with Bonehead, just plucking a couple of notes on two strings. But it was clear that being a musician wasn't in the cards for Biggin. However, this would not be a deterrent, as he was determined to be a part of this burgeoning music scene in one way or the other, and the music scene in Manchester was about to take off full blast. Now Manchester had already seen some success with the likes of The Smiths, Joy Division, Happy Mondays and New Order. Couple that with the rise of factory records and world-famous nightclub The Hacienda and Manchester was primed to be the musical capital of the world for that moment in time. Then came the summer of 1990. The Stone Roses were to play Spike Island, which set off a new musical renaissance in England that had been building up for quite some time. Manchester, for whatever it is, is something makes it want to fucking make music and it's done fucking unbelievable you know even the bz's were born here weren't they? whatever but... it was one of those game-changing gigs that set the course for the upcoming brit pop invasion britain was entering into the post thatcher era and the youth had had enough and were ready to load up on drugs and be free biggan attended this event along with bonehead and were to run into future oasis bassist quigsy there as well not long after this historical concert, Biggin would become friends with Manny from the Stone Roses. This appears to be a constant theme in Biggin's life. When he becomes passionate about something going on in Manchester, he somehow seems to thrust himself into the centre of it all. Most of us admire bands and sports teams from a distance. We put their pictures on our wall, read their press clippings, follow them on social media and spend loads of cash just trying to be a part of their world in some small way. But when Biggin becomes a fan, he ends up becoming a part of their lives. You see, as humans, we are always planting seeds, allowing other life forms to grow and prosper independently. Our interactions are constantly changing the course of each other's lives. We're not alone in this world, and we're all a part of the same journey. But Biggin knew that he personally needed to get his shit together. And what better place to ponder such dilemmas than down at the pub? So it was off to the pack horse for a little soul searching. In between debates over the threat that was Crystal Palace and the merits of Ryan Giggs, a conversation between Biggin and an old mate, Jason Watson, ensued. Jason explained how he was running his own car valet service and would be willing to show Biggin how it's done, and that he did. Seed planted, a new life is formed. Wanting to embrace this new business venture full on, Biggin worked tirelessly to get his new business cracking. 
Inevitably, he was going to need another set of hands. So he began running through his head some local mates with whom he can trust. He knew he needed someone personable with whom clients would get along with. He remembered an old friend, Steve Shenton, who matched those qualifications and decided to pay him a visit. Upon immediately being rejected, Biggin noticed a commotion coming from the next room. Steve opened the door to tell the boys to can it and were essentially told to get fucked by a cocky little teenager, which kind of impressed Biggin. Turns out this cocky little teenager was a young Liam Gallagher. Biggin was impressed by this kid's confidence and charm and soon realised he had already known his older brothers Paul and Noel from the neighbourhood. After consulting with the brothers, Biggin decided to offer Liam a job. And so it was. One opinion about Liam Gallagher that seems to get tossed around is that he craves the approval of his older male role models, particularly his brothers Paul and Noel. But praise and encouragement from those boys were hard to come by. So those father figures and male role models were absent in young Liam's life. So Biggin stepped in and became a friend and mentor to Liam, and the two of them became quite the car valeting duo. The business began to grow as well as their friendship, with his little sidekick on board, Biggin decided it was time to fish for some bigger clients. And as it appears with Biggin, there is no second tier. This man has the confidence and charisma to go for it all. So naturally he set his sights on his other passion, the Manchester United Football Club, and not surprisingly, he eventually landed such a contract. We did that man, he got a proper contract for it and everything, you know what I mean? So now Biggin's day is comprised of hanging out with the likes of Liam Gallagher and David Beckham. So, as far as business and football were concerned, Biggin was right where he wanted to be. But this charmed gig didn't come without its growing pains. Like the time Liam scratched Paul Ince's car with wire wool and a major fuck-up cover-up with Eric Cantona's Mercedes. These incidents seemed, however, to go unnoticed, at least for the time being. So the boys carried on and Biggin thought he was living the dream and his off hours were now consumed with attending gigs surrounding the thriving Manchester music scene. At this time, he was still friends with his old mate Bonehead. And one evening, mid-pint, Bonehead informed Biggin that he started a band and called it The Rain. This band consisted of Bonehead himself on guitar, Gwig Z on bass, Tony McCarroll on drums, and a singer named Chris Hutton. They had a gig the following week, and Biggin brought Liam along. Liam already knew Tony from the neighbourhood, but had yet to meet Bonehead, and still didn't get to on this particular evening. But Liam was certainly impressed by it all. At work, Liam would sometimes clamour on about how he wants to be a singer someday, in the biggest band in the world. Biggin always knew there was something about this kid. His energy and magnetism were off the charts. Biggin saw in Liam what he always wanted for himself. One Sunday morning, Biggin went around Boneheads after a gig in which the rain were expecting they might get signed by a label. After it appeared that wouldn't happen, Bonehead was dejected and suggested they might need to get a different singer if they were to continue on. It was at this moment Biggin decided to suggest that Bonehead give young Liam a go. Bonehead was unaware of who Liam was and seemed unsure if it would be wise to sack Chris Hutton for some kid he'd never met. Biggin badgered him about it for weeks and Bonehead finally agreed to give him a look. And he went, who is he? Blah, blah, blah. I didn't have a fucking clue who he was. We'd never have met him. And I said, look, I said, he's fucking up for it. He looks apart and I think he's fucking can do it. So he said, right, fuck it, get him down to mine. Biggin was excited to inform Liam off his potential big break, except Liam wanted no part of it. Biggin was confused as he thought this is what Liam had wanted and kept pushing him for weeks, constantly encouraging him and assuring him that he was made for this. Until finally, Liam gave in and told Biggin to set it up. We're still not sure exactly what brought about this shift in confidence. Perhaps he figured it would be the one and only way to get the attention of his big brother Noel. Biggin picked up Liam and brought him by Boneheads, so the two can finally meet. When Bonehead asked if he'd done much singing, Liam replied, now and again in the shower. So now Bonehead's thinking, what the fuck is this? Bonehead played something on the guitar and Liam began singing along. Bonehead wasn't exactly blown away, but he saw that Liam Gallagher thing and decided, why the hell not? 
So Big Un and the boys packed up and took this operation over to Tony's house to get his seal of approval. Tony saw the same thing. He was in. Seed planted. A new life is formed. There's times in life when the good moments, the times we hold dear and cherish, pass us by unnoticed and uncelebrated. We're always looking to the future and the possibilities of something greater. But rarely can we detect the times to embrace that are uniquely special. A few years ago, I got this comment while I was interviewing the stereo MCs. Got there very organically. It grew, up, grew over three albums and you know, it was kind of exciting times, but I've got to say, the getting there was more enjoyable than the being there. Such a time was about to explode upon these boys. What was once an ordinary working existence was about to become something greater than any of them could possibly comprehend. We've got this image of Liam Gallagher. The face, the eyebrows, the hair, the parker, the voice, the stance, the attitude, the fights, the perseverance, the scandal. We think we know him, right down to his fucking trainers. But there's only one person that can tell you who Liam Gallagher is, and that's Liam Gallagher. This young man was about to find himself, and he was going to use his new band to do it. It was now under the care of some Levenshulm boys who now needed to manage this new protégé and see what they can make of it. Mate, it was made in heaven. Whatever it fucking was, it was meant to be, mate. Simple, I know. There's tons of people out there that can sing. Each rock star has their own unique quality to their voice that becomes the signature sound of the band. It's certainly not just about making sure that you hit the notes properly. Some singers are fortunate enough to have just been born with the right set of vocal cords. Others have to take what they've got and turn it into their own unique instrument. It was evident early on that Liam had his own voice and his own style. But it would take a while to finally find the mastered version of the voice that was to become the chorus of England for an entire generation. In the first demos of the rain, you could see that it was there. It would take some coaching and encouragement from the likes of Chris and Tony Griffiths from the real people before Liam would fine tune that sound. So while the rain were getting their footing, Liam continued to work with Biggin, valeting for Manchester United. But now drummer Tony McCarroll was on board as well. So big and keeping the band employed allowed them to take their minds off of their bills and gave them the freedom to concentrate on their music. And the music was certainly starting to come together. One day, Sean Ryder from Happy Mondays was telling Biggin about how he would write lyrics with the help of nursery rhyme books. So Biggin grabbed Liam and took him to Didsbury Library for a little research. That evening, Liam went home and wrote his first song, Reminisce. The first rehearsal with Liam was at Tony's house, but they knew this wouldn't do. Bonehead knew these two girls who hooked him up with rehearsal space in the basement of a hotel, so they moved the operation there. At the first rehearsal, Bonehead set up and began playing Stone Roses songs on his guitar. The band joined in for a bit of a jam and from there they started to click. It was at this moment, Biggin claims that the Oasis sound we all know and love was born. There was no, there was no struggle. There was no yeah. frustration. There was no like, it just, it was like, it was rehearsed in fucking heaviness, and it just dropped on him. After this rehearsal space fell through, Liam's older brother Paul had some connections at the Grove in Longsight and set the band up in there, but were kicked out for stealing alcohol. So the band moved the operation here to Greenhouse Studios in Stockport, and the band's sound was now as tight as ever. Bonehead strumming chords with washed out distortion and feedback, allowing the notes to ring out and surround Liam's vocals with standard rock harmonies and riffs. Lay those elements on top of Tony's driving drum beats that were mixed with a lazy swing, and you could hear that oasis sound in its raw and unpolished form. All that was missing now was the songs. They were able to come up with enough songs to create a demo tape and land themselves a few gigs. Their first gig was in Manchester at the Boardwalk on the 18th of August, 1991. 
the same building that would also become their future rehearsal space. Biggin would tell Noel about his brother's band and Noel would immediately slag it off and didn't take it too seriously. Noel was living at India House in city centre with his girlfriend Louise. Biggin came around that evening and the three of them walked down to the boardwalk to see Liam's gig. On their way there, a car rolls by and gives a honk. It's Ryan Giggs of Manchester United and he proceeds to tell Biggin he's got him sorted out with some fight tickets. This all took Noel by surprise and can see for himself that Biggin was a man with some Manchester connections. During the gig, Biggin could see that Noel was impressed and began buzzing on about how good they were and how good his little brother was. However, backstage after the gig, when the band approached Noel and asked him how it was, he replied that it was shit and Biggin could see that Bonehead was giving a bit too much weight to Noel's opinion as to why he didn't like it. They all immediately wanted to impress Noel, and at that moment gave Noel the power and encouragement to believe that he could make this band his own and take over the reins of control. He was to make them believe that they were shit and that they needed him to get past that. But in reality, they had the sound he had been looking for himself for quite some time. Yeah. Noel never had that. No one's running around looking for that for fucking time. No one was shit, he couldn't fucking create that. He came up with a plan to write some songs for them and go from there. But Noel had already been running around with a bunch of these songs in his head, and now he saw a band that he can use them with. The boys eventually agreed to bring Noel on board. His experiences hanging out as a roadie within spiral carpets and seeing how a functioning band operates firsthand is wisdom the other band members found to be valuable. Biggin and Noel had gone on a double date with these two girls and ended up at the Hacienda. Noel was buzzing on with Biggin about how he had this audition lined up with In Spiral Carpets. The carpets eventually rejected Noel as their singer, but instead offered him a job as a roadie. So as far as the rain were concerned, Noel would bring his guitar and his connections. At first, Biggin warned Bonehead not to let Noel take control of the band. He can sense that a tyrant was amongst them. I went to Bone, he's like, I said, don't let him take over. Come in this band and take control of it. But he did. The fucking moment he walked in there, because Liam was fucking ecstatic. He, he took him to another level, because his brother was there. But excitable, but still not getting the ball. He was there teasing him with the ball. But Noel had his master plan and was going to use these four gentlemen to bring it to fruition. So it was going to be his way or the highway. And total control over this monster was now in the hands of one Noel Gallagher. From that day forth, everything involving Oasis would be manipulated and controlled by him. It didn't set off any major alarms at first. The band had no clue exactly where this was all headed, but they all knew something was happening and were just happy to be along for the ride. And what a ride it was. Adding Noel as a second guitarist instantly thickened the sound. And that extra layer of lead guitar was the final ingredient the band needed to solidify the direction in which their songs would now be headed. With Noel now in the band, it was time to get to work. The band were rehearsing at this time underneath the boardwalk. Noel would always be the last one to turn up and his entrance would signify that it was time to now pay attention. Noel wouldn't say anything and everyone would be looking around and back at Noel as if to say, Right, Noel, so what are we doing? All of a sudden, Noel would just plug in and out, would come songs like Take Me and Rock and Roll Star and Slide Away. Everyone in the room was gobsmacked. They couldn't believe the songs that were coming out of this man. The band was quick to pick up this vibe and would mostly get the gist of the songs in one or two takes. Biggin couldn't believe what he was hearing. He sat there in the corner of the boardwalk in his red leather chair and began dreaming of the future possibilities for this band. The final piece to this puzzle was the songs, and it appears that they had now arrived. When Noel came into that band, right, he demanded it, the respect, right, because he's, in his mind, he thought, right, I'll join, because you fucking need me, you cunts, like it was shit what they had, mm. but it wasn't. They had it. Bonehead fucking found... Bonehead's not asked about this, mate. You don't give a fuck, because he didn't want the attention. He doesn't yeah, give a fuck, mate, but if he was to fucking stand up and fucking tell it the real story, it wouldn't be all about Noel Gallagher. But he wanted it like that, because Bonehead didn't want the spotlight on him. One rainy evening, they pulled up in Bonehead's car outside Noel's flat at India House. While waiting at a traffic light, they greeted a man waiting at the bus stop. The man looked back, 
raised his fist and said, live forever. This phrase struck Liam and he buzzed about it in the car for a while. That week, Noel would write, live forever, alone his flat. A few days later, Biggin came around to Noel's before they went to rehearsal. He was strumming a new tune and Biggin asked what it was. Noel replied, live forever, and played it for Biggin. He was getting a sneak peek at a tune that will certainly live forever. Noel brought that song into rehearsal with him and showed it to the other band members. Bonehead couldn't believe what he was hearing. It was so good, he questioned whether Noel could have possibly written it himself. But that he did, and the band picked up on the song in one take. This is the moment they knew that this band was going to be unstoppable. Liam Gallagher is a very spiritual person. He takes moments like the gentleman saying, live forever as signs of things meant to be. The same would hold true for the discovery of the band's name. One evening while Biggin and a few others were hanging out in Liam's bedroom, a mate, Chris Johnson, pointed at an In Spiral Carpets tour poster and saw the name Oasis Leisure Centre in Swindon listed as a gig. He suggested it to Liam and it stayed in his head. A few days later, while Biggin and Liam were driving to the cliff for a day's work, they passed the Oasis Aquarium. Liam noticed it and took it as another sign. The name was changed. The rain were now oasis. The sound was there, the songs were now there, the name was in place. Now they just needed to do something with it. So they began searching for gigs around Manchester, which was not easy because Manchester had some serious bands about at this time, all competing for stage time. They tried places like the Witchwood in Ashton, but were turned away. But on the 19th of October, 1991, they played their first gig with Noel at the boardwalk their usual stomping grounds. Next to nobody attended this gig, except Biggin and a few other mates. That trial by fire with Noel was now behind them. It was time to get down to business. The songs kept coming and the rehearsals were getting tighter. The buzz within the band was growing. Biggin knew they were onto something huge. It was now just a matter of how to use it. In the meantime, Biggin, Liam and Tony carried on valeting for Manchester United. Being around such high-profile superstars was beginning to wear off on Liam. He was learning how to walk and talk with the confidence and swagger of a megastar. Not that he needed much help with that, but being around these boys fine-tuned and cemented that strut. He was ready to do this. All they needed now was an opening. The band started picking up more gigs in small bars and clubs, playing to just a handful of people. Places like the Hippodrome and Club 57 in Manchester and Le Bateau and Crazy House in Liverpool. They played a total of 13 small gigs before their fateful performance at King Tut's in Glasgow on the 31st of May 1993. The gig that got them discovered by Alan McGee and signed to Creation Records and eventually sold off to Sony. This is where everything changed. Signing to creation now gave them a level of credibility and access to a PR staff to spread the word. In the 90s, certain labels carried a lot of weight in the alternative music scene. 4AD, Sub Pop, Rough Trade. But for the shoegazer and Britpop crowd, the title belonged to Creation Records. They were pumping out bands like Ride, My Bloody Valentine, Slow Dive and Jesus and Mary Chain. If you were into that scene, you trusted just about everything that label would put out. So when Oasis signs with a label like Creation, there's a built-in buzz that comes with the package. A ready-made audience just waiting to go mad for it. And boy did they... They all knew this would turn things up a notch, but were unaware of just how mental it would all quickly become. Biggin and Liam had this thing before he joined the band where they would go out to pubs and tell the girls they were in a band called The Moochers. Their little fantasy world was about to become a reality. Oasis was for real, and the people were catching on. Oasis was more than just a fucking band, mate. Biggin and Liam would now go out to the pubs, and Liam would instantly get noticed and the place would start buzzing. One evening, the two of them would head off to the restroom and Biggin could see Liam tripping on the attention he was getting. He would then walk out to two fine ladies propositioning him. 
after which the three of them would escape downstairs. Not long after, Liam would reappear with a sly grin on his face, if you know what I mean. They would then leave that pub to head off to a house party. While in the car, Biggin could see Liam was acting a bit frantic on his first ecstasy trip. Liam opens the door and runs out of the car in the pouring rain, down the street and into a pub. Biggin proceeds to chase after him, and when he approaches the pub, Liam comes out in a craze going on about how Supersonic was playing on the jukebox inside. The next morning, Biggin and Liam woke up and headed to a local breakfast joint. When they arrived, everyone in the place started whistling Supersonic at them. This was the type of thing that was starting to happen on a daily basis. Biggin was excited to be surrounded by such a buzz, but he also knew it was a matter of time before he lost them to the world. This was a whole new experience for Liam. Everything they ever worked for just came alive. He was now getting noticed by the masses, and life would never be the same. It was the beginning of the roller coaster trip, and Biggin was holding on tight for dear life. It began to accelerate in their minds after one particular gig in Leeds. The week prior, Oasis was featured on the TV programme, The Word. This grabbed the attention of the kids in Leeds, and the line to get in the Duchess that night was queued around the block. As they pulled up in the van, Gwigsy asked what the commotion was about. They soon realised all those people were there to see them. The buzz between them was unreal. They knew it was all happening. Bigger dreams await. It was the end of innocence. No longer were they to try and get people's attention. They now had it, and Bigger knew things would never be the same. It was the scale of it. Fucking Jesus Christ. All I can say is be careful what you fucking wish for. As the mania surrounding the band progressed, Noel had a moment with Biggin where he told him that he's going to need to find a job to do. Noel had seen the next level within Spiral Carpets and knew how this all worked. But what to do? It was suggested that Biggin become a drum tech for Tony. But Biggin was having none of that. He wasn't about to start lugging gear for his mate and valet employee Tony just to stick around. He felt he was more than that to this band and to these guys. He refused to follow that suggestion, so he carried on business as usual. At one point, Tony pulled Biggin aside and warned him about the types of people that were hanging around him and coming backstage at the gigs. At a few venues, some purses and wallets had gone missing from the dressing rooms, and the band started to suspect it was the crowds that was hanging around Biggin doing the nicking. He told Biggin that he was essentially attracting 20 or 30 Liam Gallagher's backstage. It was one of the first signs that the band were getting a little weary with Biggin's presence, and Biggin could sense it. Liam had become a major star, and Biggin could now see that Liam didn't want Biggin talking to anyone. The press, the fans, etc. Liam needed to distance himself from Biggin and stand as his own man. Biggin's stubborn pride didn't help in these situations. He knew who these guys were and what he meant to them. Now he felt like Liam was flying above him and was being a bit cocky and arrogant about it. These are the moments when celebrities separate themselves from the rest of society. They get caught up in the hype and their ego goes into overdrive. You get enough people telling you how great you are and you start to believe them. The band was getting bigger and bigger. The hype was kicking into overdrive. This meant the band would begin traveling abroad and spending more time away from Manchester. Biggin could have gone with them at this point, but his dedication to his gig with Manchester United kept him at home. Biggin had to decide between his desires and his responsibilities. He knew walking away from Man U wasn't the smart thing to do. So he soldiered on with one ear to the radio to get his daily fix of hearing his friends catapulting themselves to superstardom. During one of these trips from home, Liam was interviewed for what would become one of the band's first major press features. In this interview, Liam began telling stories about his recent days valeting with Biggin for Manchester United. He thought the interview would focus on the band and the music, so this was just a whimsical side story. However, this ended up being the story. The headline was printed highlighting the Man U follies, not the band or the music. It is the English press, after all. The next day, Biggin arrives at the cliff as usual for another day's work, only to be summoned to Sir Alex Ferguson's office. This would scare the shit out of any of the players, let alone just a team employee. 
So there was Biggin sitting outside Sir Alex's office, waiting like he was back in school outside the principal's office while the Man U players walked by and ridiculed him for being a naughty boy. Biggin still didn't know what this was all about. When Sir Alex finally calls Biggin in, he picks up the newspaper and shows it to Biggin and demands an explanation. This is not good PR for the team, and Alex now had to get involved. He was out and his dream job was gone in an instant. And then the next thing, they're all talking about cocaine and my mom, and it was fucking what the fuck, and I get the sack from United. The band came back to Manchester, and Biggin went around Liam's for a little chat and an explanation. At the very least, an apology. Their mother, Peggy, calls upstairs for Liam to come down. He stood at the top of the stairs looking down at Biggin wearing his new shorts and fresh haircut. Biggin tells Liam that he's been sacked by Manchester United and it was because of him and his big mouth that it happened. Liam looks at Biggin unapologetically and says, What are you worried about that for, mate? You're with us now. Biggin's feeling like, well, that's fantastic, but what exactly does that mean? It would never be clarified. It was what Noel was warning Biggin about. At some point, you're going to have to officially be on payroll. Just hanging about won't do. Biggin's extremely torn and perplexed at this point. This is a band he loves, and the rest of the country is falling in love as well. He doesn't want to let that go, as no one would. But there's a part of him that now wants to give these boys a piece of his mind. They were acting arrogantly and distant towards a very proud man, one that had been with them from the get-go and had now lost his dream job because of them. He felt the least they could do was sort him out, but what he encountered was more resistance. Biggin carried on hanging around the band and helping out in any way that he could, but he could sense their attitude towards him begin to change. They lost all sense of fucking reality. It seemed to be coming to a head around the time of their gig in Derby at the warehouse. Because of space restrictions, Biggin had to ride home in the back of the van, cramped up with the amplifiers. The next morning, Bonehead calls Biggin furious about a broken amplifier and blames Biggin for it. The following week, Oasis were playing at the university. When Biggin arrived, the backstage security acknowledged that he was on the guest list but no backstage passes. The guard explained, the band aren't having you, mate, and sent Biggin on his way. So now Biggin's enjoying Oasis out with the crowd like he's just another fan. I was treated then like one of them, like some fucking anger on, do you know what I mean? He was fucking taking the piss. He knew that was it. His ties within the band were being severed and he felt lost. He was magnetized and couldn't pull away from them. It was in him. He was a part of it. But it was apparent that there was now a wedge between him and Liam. At one point, Liam accused Biggin of stealing some Jack Daniels. Little petty things like this were starting to divide them. The Gallaghers were starting to lose all sense of reality. There were now cracks in the foundation, ones that Biggin wasn't quite sure how to repair. It's like he had gone to the top of the roller coaster and fell off it. The question now becomes, why? When a rock band becomes huge, they become part of the establishment. Your band logo becomes another logo for the corporate machine that is rock and roll and the music business. Bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones no longer have to be sold but maintained. The stories and the legend behind rock bands becomes just as much a part of the band as the music, especially after a band has broken up and there's no more music. All you have left is the legend and the stories behind the music. We spend hours watching documentaries and rare footage from our favourite bands and piece together the magical and mystical journey they and their fans embarked upon. There's at least a dozen DVDs out there documenting the early days and the rise of the Beatles. We dream along with them and bask in their glory upon reaching stardom. It's an endearing story and makes us love and appreciate them forevermore. Oasis is one of those bands. They left their mark on British pop culture, a national phenomenon as big as the Beatles. Their working man background and rise to fame is a story to behold and inspire. The music that came from these boys was the cherry on top. The fact that it was coming from such working class Manchester boys made it all the more charming and became the central image of the band. This was never more prevalent than with the Oasis versus Blur public relations swindle of the early 90s, the posh suburbanites against the streetwise hoodlums. It's a facade, a charade, a PR ploy to sell more albums and target demographics. 
When it works, it's to be guarded by the full might of the industry and its team of high-priced lawyers and managers. Noel was the man in control of this band's destiny and the legend that came with it. And Biggin wasn't to be a part of that story. You can see examples of the discrepancies in future Oasis interviews. The band seems to make it a point not to mention Biggin. A new bonnet and a new quicks, and they were in a band called The Rain. They'd heard I was cool and had my epiphany and all that bollocks. Someone in passing just said, you know, Liam wanted to be in a band. Liam came out of my house. But his voice was just like, whoa, you know, it's like, yeah. It's like, you know, there was a kebab shop called Oasis. There was a fucking taxi van called Oasis. It's that fucking name keeps coming up, Oasis. Kind of a little bit out on our own. I just thought Oasis sounds good. You see, Biggin being the man that made it happen was not to be the story. It was way too much credit than the Gallagher boys were willing or going to give. That makes Biggin the unknown mythical creature in the land of Oasis. His existence and contributions were being suppressed, and the burden of that defence was now on the Gallagher brothers. The Oasis story had to be controlled, and therefore so did Biggin. It was a sad reality for Biggin. He truly loved this band and the music. He felt a part of it and couldn't let it go. But he also knew he needed to sort it out and get on with his life, which was not easy. Being that close to an English pop culture phenomenon is an experience you want to share with everyone in proximity every time an Oasis tune comes on the radio. How could you not? It's too much insider information to not just come bursting out. I think we'd all have that proud moment and just start name dropping all over everyone's shoes. So it was never something Biggin could really escape, but he tried his best to soldier on. Local Mancunians who were wise knew about Biggin but it never really reached too far beyond that. That was until drummer Tony McCarroll decided to release a book entitled Oasis, The Truth. And that it was. Tony had his own beef with the band and the nonsense stories surrounding its origins and the reasons that Noel eventually sacked Tony from the band. The day he got sacked was one of the worst days of Tony's life. And who did he go see immediately afterwards? Biggin, of course. The two of them went on a three-day bender, bonding over the misery being caused by the Gallagher boys. While Tony was there, an episode of Spitting Image came on the television, in which Oasis were the featured band. So now Tony's watching himself on the telly, playing with the band he was no longer allowed to enjoy. This bender culminated in the two of them on their knees, wondering what they're going to say to everyone who asks, what happened? The two of them knew they'd been done wrong and left to the side of the road. Tony decided to write about it. Biggin was a central figure throughout the book. The mythical creature lurking in the shadows in the land of Oasis was now exposed. The press and the fans were now upon him. People were now coming up to him and buzzing on about Oasis and asking questions. This is not attention that Biggin had invited, but he attracted it. And now, here it was. He was now getting random phone calls from the press, like The Sun asking questions like, did Noel recently purchase a brown Bentley? And getting offered 500 quid to dish out some inside info on the band. This is too much power he was now wielding over the band and needed to be controlled. One way politicians and business people control their opposition is to plant seeds of doubt in regards to their opponent's credibility in the public's perception. If you can expose someone as a liar once, that stigma hangs on them like an albatross. They have to work extra hard to gain that trust back. So now that Biggin was getting his unwanted attention, it appears the inner circles of Oasis devised a plan to discredit Biggin in the eyes of the masses and hopefully ward off any future truth drops that the band didn't want becoming public. So one evening, Biggin received a random phone call from Alan McGee of Creation Records asking if Biggin would join him at a private club in London. So Biggin and his wife went along. After a few drinks, McGee says to Biggin, let's have a laugh and leak to the press that Oasis is planning on getting back together. Biggin seemed unsure but went along anyhow. So when he received a call from the press, he leaked the info McGee had told him. This got published, and when the press came to McGee for his comment, he denied ever even speaking to Biggin. So now Biggin's left looking the fool and soaking in the humiliation. 
At a later date, Biggin attended an Oasis gig at Lancashire Cricket Grounds. He had a box and some Manchester City boys with him. Liam had spotted them and alerted Noel backstage to their presence. Noel then proceeded to send six of his security goons to Biggin's box to have him removed. Not just asked politely to leave, but handled physically and picked up over their heads like he was crow surfing. This act of public humiliation was what Noel needed to show everyone that Biggin was just a fool and shouldn't be trusted. Everyone changed around me. I was getting attention, the wrong attention. I was getting fucking bad press. It was like some battle with him. Fucking every week I was in the press. Biggin was being played by the mighty machine and felt powerless against it. The weight of it all was taking its toll on Biggin's personal life. He no longer knew who to trust and who to turn to for some peace and closure from it all. At his most vulnerable point, a solicitor got into Biggin's head about how he's entitled to some financial compensation from Oasis for the contributions he made in the band's early stages. Not something Biggin ever wanted to do. He'd always protected this band and flew the flag proudly. It was never about the money. It was always about his extended family and this thing they created together. But at this point in his life, Biggin felt like he had no other options. So he decided to take the band to court and actually got legal aid from the state to do so. On the day of his court appearance, things appeared to be going well. His lawyer made his case and the judge seemed to be going right along. At the point of recess, it looked like an easy win for Biggin. He went out and phoned his wife to tell her the good news, that everything looks to be in his favour. When he returns from recess, the three lawyers who were previously sat there had been replaced with just one lawyer, who just also happened to be a lawyer for Prince Charles as well. The mood in the room had shifted, and the decision now was on the side of Noel. When things didn't look good for Noel, he picked up the bat phone and made his call to the handler, and Biggin got handled. So now Biggin was not only walking away empty-handed, but had now burned that bridge with Noel in the process. At a later meet-up, Noel would point out that they may have had a chance at reconciliation, but taking him to court is where he ultimately fucked up. Noel made it clear where he now stood with Biggin, and Noel doesn't ever seem to be bothered with whom he excommunicates. Look at everyone around Oasis. They've all been sacked. Everyone's got a problem. Everyone's angry. When you've reached the legendary status that Noel has achieved, you don't want anyone knocking you off that road to knighthood. It's a bit of an insecurity that always seems to have plagued Noel. Part of his persona, or shtick if you will, was to always put down other bands and musicians in interviews. He was always trying to keep others off his pedestal. That includes Biggin as well. Liam's a different animal entirely. He deals with being excommunicated from his brother as well. He's even written songs targeting Noel explicitly. For a while, Liam had hit rock bottom. His brother took his band from him, and his path now seemed uncertain. More and more his past will catch up to him, and his relationship with Biggin is no exception. The last encounter Biggin had with Liam was while BDI were touring and staying at the Lowry Hotel in Manchester. Biggin had spotted Liam near the hotel lounge and immediately was drawn over to him. At first, Liam appeared a bit defensive and standoffish. But within a few seconds of looking over Biggin, Liam's defences broke down and he gave Biggin a warm welcome and the two shared a pint and buzzed on like old times. Andy Bell joined in the conversation and before you know it, Biggin's telling old Oasis stories to Oasis. Liam appeared to be appreciating the time reminiscing with an old friend. Andy Bell expressed his gratitude to Biggin for giving him more insight into the world of Noel Gallagher. At some point, Liam exclaimed to Biggin that he was a star in his own right. But then, in a vulnerable moment, Liam being Liam says to Biggin, OK, look, I'll give you half of what I've got and you give me half of what you've got. This took Biggin aback, because for him it wasn't about money. What he really wanted Liam to understand was, I don't want a penny from you, nor do I want to sue you for such. But if I was to do such a thing, why would that be and hopefully Liam could understand the man he left behind, jobless and waiting on empty promises. The years have gone by, and Biggin was tending to his business, but not a day would pass without reminiscing on the magical days of Oasis. If his mind did wander to other matters, the fans and the press would seek him out and immediately pull him back in. 
The toxic world of Facebook and Twitter has all sorts of Oasis fanatics coming at him from every angle, from love and support and appreciation to downright threats and intimidation. People would constantly suggest that Biggin should write a book to tell his side of the story. He initially resisted but finally decided to do it, thinking this would bring some honest closure to it all. Instead, it's made things worse. Liam Noel and Bonehead were now put in a defensive position, and they've got a loyal allegiance of fans behind them. But the question still remains, why the defensiveness and dismissiveness towards Biggin to this day? What does Biggin have or know that they can't have get out? It appears to be not much. He's just a twist to the official narrative, a wild card, the joker in the deck. When you've created a brand like Oasis, that label will be slapped on every book, magazine, movie, TV special and conversation that involves the history of British rock and roll. Right there alongside the Beatles, the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin. When a band reaches that level of institutional stardom, the stories and the legend of the band become just as much a part of it all as the music. Their legacy is all they've got. Therefore, it must be guarded with dear life. It seems trivial with some things, but not to the ones controlling the band's legacy. We live in a world of deception. The media and educational institutions spin reality to suit their agenda. We're all a bit tired of the idea that things need to be filtered, spun and rinsed before being presented to the masses. The big lie has become so prevalent in our society with business, politics and media that there's a bit of a desire to keep such things out of our pleasurable activities like music. Biggin loves Oasis, just like millions of other fans do. He continues to protect that band because they're like family. No matter how much they hurt him, he continues to soldier on for them. And as a wiser, grown man, he chooses to move forward, living in the truth. Word had gotten out to Bonehead that Biggin had done an interview with the BBC talking about the early days of Oasis. Bonehead had his lawyers call the station and force them to pull it from airing. It makes you wonder what Bonehead is so afraid of. Recently, Liam did this interview entitled Manchester United Ruined My Life in the 90s. They ask him about his days valeting for Man U and he starts his reply off like this. Me mate. Who goes round, I can't, I can't even mention his name because he's f***ing talking shit in the press at the moment about how he started Oasis and stuff. Anyway, he had a white van. He didn't say he won't mention his name, he said he can't mention his name. Big difference between the two in such a context. But it shows that Liam hasn't forgotten his old friend, even if he can't yet humble himself to give Big Un his due respect. It's a shame that such an amazing band that has brought so much happiness to millions of people can't just live in peace and harmony and celebrate the accomplishments with all the people involved. Liam wants his older brother and his band back. Noel won't let him have it. Tony just wanted to continue playing drums for the band he loved and helped create. Noel wouldn't let him have it. Biggin just wants some respect and recognition for his contributions. Noel won't let him have it. He's the man with the master plan and he's going to continue to do it his way. Biggin continues his search for peace and truth and he's going to continue to do it his way. Because the moment they say anything about me, that's it. Give me massive exposure. The memories of the days of Oasis are bittersweet for Biggin. He was a big influence and it was too much for Noel and Liam to acknowledge. It's brought Biggin so much personal joy and satisfaction to be a part of something so great and meaningful as the band Oasis. It's too much to keep inside. The temptation to share it with the world is too great because in the end, true happiness is only real when shared. And because of my love for the band, mm. I've had to front it because I love the fucking bit. I wanted to enjoy it. 